Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, second keynote um, lecture of the Winter 22 uh, Econometric Society meetings. Uh, it's a special pleasure to um, welcome Dirk Bergerman, who will be giving the lecture, and um, Jacques Cremer from Toulouse, who will be chairing the session. Um, uh, we, I've known Jacques and, and Dirk for a very long time, and it's a special pleasure to welcome two old friends to, to this meeting. Uh, this is a very timely um, subject to which uh, Dirk is going to speak, and Jacques has been very deeply involved with many of the questions surrounding industrial organization and policy and regulation at uh, the European level. Uh, so I hand over the floor to, to, to Jacques and um, please. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, <laughs> last week, I had a little email exchange with uh, Sanjeev. Uh, I asked him, uh, how long do you want my introduction to be? I was thinking very short. To which uh, Sanjeev was uh, replied, I'm happy to defer to you on the length of introduction, but I'm sure Dirk would enjoy you saying nice things about him. Uh, so I will make a compromise. I won't make it very short. It won't be too long, don't worry. Uh, but I will not spend my time saying nice things about Dirk. Uh, yes, you know, he's a great economist. He's published lots of papers in great journal, but he's been told that a hundred times. He doesn't need a hundred and first time. Uh, Rather, what I'd like to do is spend two or three minutes telling you why I think that this lecture is really appropriate for a meeting focused on younger researchers. Uh, I think that uh, what Dirk and his colleagues on the project uh, that he's going to present uh, are doing is really a model for what theory should be doing at the present time. I mean, as we all know, theory is uh, somewhat in a crisis, economic theory. It's considered by uh, many as irrelevant, you know, at least Part of the theoretical researchers have taken refuge in esoteric pursuits where nobody will come and disturb them, where uh, others try to make relevant models which focus on really micro issues. And you know, I think that if theory is in crisis, uh, so is economics, because you know, we can accumulate all the data in the world. If we don't have intellectual tools to interpret it, we don't understand anything. And what Dirk and his co-authors have are doing and it's in this paper, in the others that they are doing in this big research project they have, is to take on a very big topic, which is how do we exchange data? What are the markets for data? And try to understand uh, the fundamental forces at play when agents exchange data. So this is not trying to be relevant in the sense, oh, here's a situation I can model. It is trying to be relevant in the way great theory is, is let me show you a model which will provide tools to understand the fundamental forces at play in an important part of the economy. So for all of you, you are doing uh, research in theory, listen to what Dirk is doing and try to imitate him. Now, I must admit this is easier, say, you know, than, easier said than done. Uh, but for those of you who do theory, you know, the type of work they're doing is really a model and enjoy it, listen to it and learn from it. Dirk. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jacques, uh, and thank you, Sanji, for this very kind words introduction. I um, take the introduction also as, as an, an apology, an excuse to say this is really an area that I think is um, wide open and is really just beginning to be investigated. Um, so what we are showing you today is really um, sort of just first uh, steps. Um, and I would encourage you to, to think about these as, uh, as big, uh, but also open areas for research and investigation. So um, with this, let me try to, um, to get right into it. Um, the title of the paper is called Economics of Social Data and is jointly with Alessandro Bonati from MIT and Tan Gan, who is a graduate student um, at Yale. What um, really motivated us um, is to try to understand um, the incredible hunger or thirst, if you wish, of uh, the large digital platforms to collect um, individual user data. So 
Uh, we know about Amazon, Facebook, Google in the US. Um, but in fact, if you look at China, uh, JD, Tencent, Alibaba, so to just name a few, uh, in many ways, uh, you would find if you were to experience those services that they um, are maybe even a few steps ahead in terms of uh, how much individual user data they collect um, and, and how rapidly they're progressing in that direction. And with the steadily increasing user base, uh, really what is being collected is massive amounts of data about individual consumers, clearly their preferences, but also their location, their friends and their political views. So really um, often a second by second or a minute by minute uh, tracking and tracing of uh, the individual and social activities of individuals. And um, these individual level data clearly help the companies to provide very valuable digital services uh, to all of us. So if you think about search engines, if you think about personal product recommendation, if you think about informative ratings, all of these things really use the huge amounts of data that they collect um, uh, to offer us predictions or rating that help us guide, steer, uh, direct our decisions. Okay. Um, but while the data that is being collected is, is highly individual, highly, um, you know, um, targeted, what I, we want to emphasize today is really that the central aspect, uh, it sounds perhaps a little bit paradoxical, of the individual data is its social dimension, okay? Namely, the data that we get as, or that the digital platform gets for any particular individual user is not just informative about him, or her, but it's informative about users similar to them. Okay, and that is really uh, the essence of the data collection because it, it allows the platforms to not only predict individual behavior but uh, a lot of behavior by people close by. So, so we're really talking about social data, even though the collection happened at the individual level. And it is the social dimension of the data that is really driving the value of the digital services. So whenever you uh, think about, you know, networks, rankings, it's really pouring together lots of different um, sources and networks that, that is underlying uh, the, the social dimension. Okay. Think about shopping data, for example. Uh, an individual purchases to convey information to a third party about the willingness to pay for a given product is of course not just saying something about this person, but about all consumers with similar purchase histories. And to that extent, it's the social nature of the data uh, that generates at its core and sort of um, uh, at, the, at the very essence of it, a significant information externality or data externality. And the, the impact and the consequences of that data externality is what we're going to try to uh, analyze in this paper, okay? So having said that, um, the social dimension of the data um, simultaneously leads to a loss of privacy because much of the things that are informative or that are interesting about me is already captured in information from others who are like me, okay? Uh, it also leads to gain of information because clearly past experiences or concurrent experiences of people who are like me uh, help me also make decisions. What is interesting about the data externality is really that compared to other externalities, you think of environmental externalities, um, you know, um, is that the sign and the magnitude of the, the externality, that is the impact of the externality really, and that's what we're going to try to show, will depend on the structure of the data and will also depend on the downstream use of the data. Okay. But independent of the direction in some sense and the sign, this significant data externality suggests that market outcomes are likely to, to be inefficient and that, uh, with that we will need to think about correctives. And to, to make things uh, sort of scale up a little bit more, when we talk about data, these data um, that are being collected really inform algorithms that then operate. And so the externality that operates at the level of the data may in fact operate multiple times or at an extensive scales because it then flows into the use and operation of the algorithms. So what are we thinking about? Um, we want today think about um, just schematically about two markets that are closely linked. Uh, 
um, on the one hand side, there's a data market. Even, you know, um, spatially, we want to think of this as the upstream market um, that collects data from consumers by data intermediaries. So think about Google or Facebook, and then returns the data in the to some information to a producer um, who then uses the data in various ways in what we want to call the downstream market. So that is the second layer of um, the market. Okay. So instantiations of this, examples of this, is think about search, right? So every time um, you enter a search term on a search engine such as Google, um, you getting in you providing Google with information in turn get um, a service okay that is then being monetized by the advertisers to uh, show you sponsored search link and then these sponsored search links uh, presumably lead to some interaction and downstream within the product. Another example that shows that of course, a simple triangle can be expanded and it will typically uh, be of a more complicated form. So if you think about Facebook, a lot of the interaction happens on Facebook, but it happen also happens on further apps that have access to Facebook and that are being hosted on Facebook. And so then the data actually flows through an entire supply chain. Again, there's an upstream market, the data market, and there's a downstream market, uh, the product market that closely interacts. The three central questions that we want to pursue today is that uh, given that the individual, the consumer data is acquired, aggregated and sold, uh, we want to think about how the social dimension of the data impact the terms of trade because between consumers, the data partners, these are the producers, the advertisers, and the large digital platforms. We want to think about how the social dimension of data magnifies the value of the individual data for the platforms and how it may lower the cost of data acquisition through the externality. Okay. And finally, we want to think about how market power by the digital platforms changes the level of aggregation and the precision of information that the data intermediaries may provide about individual consumers. Okay. Um, and finally, I'm just inviting you to think sort of as a counterfactual how these digital platforms would operate if the data had no social uh, dimension. That is, if anything that could be learned about me uh, would not be informative about anything but the, my specific individual. You can imagine right away then uh, that something like Facebook would basically not uh, be relevant and that a lot of the um, learning that comes from the, the multiplicity of data, say in search engine, also would not be available. So that's just to suggest that it's really the social dimension of the data that is a key um, at, in all of these questions. Okay, uh, let me now go, um, since I'm basically um, going to talk uninterruptedly, so um, Apologies for that. Uh, let me now present you the model and then go in three steps um, through the analysis. Okay, so the model that we're going to look at today is one that will have a data broker and a producer um, as monopolists in their markets. And in between, they're going to be end consumers. The consumer has a willingness to pay, WI, uh, that drives his, um, his purchases. And what he's trying to look at is simply to maximize in the product market his net utility, which is coming from a linear quadratic utility, where um, he values each individual good with the willingness to pay WI. And of course, he has to pay a price P per unit. So we're thinking about a model um, of essentially linear price discrimination. So this is a model that is flexible enough to accommodate second and third degree price discrimination and gives us a way to think about sharing the gains of information between the producer and the consumer. Okay, The producer is simply going to choose prices. If he has information to make them personal, he can choose to personalize them and then maximize the, the net revenue that he gathers from them. That is it um, for the product market. 
uh, for the data market or the data environment, um, we're going to um, think about two elements. So the consumer types is really their underlying willingness to pay that's jointly distributed um, with this uh, mean and mu in terms of the willingness to pay and the variance that we are simply going to normalize being equal to one. Okay, the consumer uh, is going to have imperfect information about his willingness to pay. That is, he may not have perfect information about his preferences. That's where recommendation engines, ratings, and so come in. And so that's going to be modeled by the fact that initially he observes a signal that contains his willingness to pay, but that signal may come with an error E. The error E is, uh, is scaled with a variance or standard deviation sigma. And the signal is simply uh, the addition of the underlying willingness to play plus the error term. Again, uh, there's going to be a joint distribution, possibly with correlation of the consumer errors term. It's an error, so it's going to have average, a mean equal to zero. And we can again normalize the variance because we have the scaling term signal. Okay. And otherwise, we're simply going to say that the willingness to pay and the errors are independent and um, that they admit symmetric densities. Okay. A leading example, um, if it may help you to think about it, is the multivariate normal distribution, but we don't have to restrict ourselves to this. In this case, the willingness to pay is simply the addition of two terms, a common and shock and an idiosyncratic shock. And likewise, the a uh, signal can be the addition of the underlying willingness to pay plus the error. The error can again contain an idiosyncratic and an aggregate shock. So uh, this is uh, in some sense just a representation of a very simple network, a sort of a uniform network where um, each consumer has some idiosyncratic component and then there's a common component that is shared by all of the agents. Okay. Good. The, the key modeling choices that um, I want to emphasize before we're heading into the analysis is that um, any information beyond the common prior that we have is going to come from the consumer signals and from the reporting of the consumer signals. So the, really the data is being generated by the consumers. Data sharing uh, certainly allows the producer to learn more about the consumer, but it also allows possibly the consumer to learn more about their preferences to the extent that there is correlation, either in the willingness to pay or in the error. Okay. It's helpful to think about the correlation in the fundamentals or the willingness to pay as common attributes that the consumer share. And by contrast, the correlation in the noise and in error terms as the common experience that they share. Okay. And learning can happen through both channels, either through the common attributes or through the common experience. Either one captures part of the social dimensions of the data. So that's that that's a key modeling um, aspect here. Okay. Good. So I'm going to uh, move in three steps through the analysis and hopefully that helps us um, sort of make it a little bit easier to digest and understand the structure of uh, the data markets. I'm first going to ask myself what's the impact on consumer, producer and social welfare if for some reason the market were to completely share the data without any further doing by the data intermediary. So just what's the impact of data sharing on the social outcome? Um, once we understand that, then we can ask ourselves, will there be scope for data sharing in an equilibrium? That is, is there going to be the uh, profitable data sharing happening in equilibrium that's going to be facilitated by the data intermediary? And in this second step, we're just going to look at uh, complete data sharing. And in a third step, we're thinking about optimal data sharing, where we're going to say the intermediary can actually structure the data in a way that allows him to maximize the profit. So that's when we're going to think about um, 
things like introducing logs, things like anonymization, and we're basically moving to questions of optimal information design. Okay. So let's start with um, asking what's the impact of data in this market? And we're going simply going to hypothesize that the individual data, that is the signals of all the individuals is shared completely in the market. That is, is uh, in particular available to the producer when he has to set the price, okay? So what's happening then? Well, um, if the data is shared, the uh, consumer, but also the firms will form an expectation, a posterior expectation of what the underlying willingness to pay is. Okay? That will allow the consumer to make a choice in terms of the quantity given the demand, uh, given the price that he's facing. And that will allow the firm to set an optimal price, a price that will be tailored to his expectation of the consumer's willingness to pay. And that is um, PI star. Okay. So at the level um, of the interim, the signal realization, the surplus in society really depends just on the posterior expectation. Okay. When we then write the ex-ante payoffs, that is, we're going to say, what are the, the gains from information for a particular information structure S, so that can be complete data sharing, but later on we'll generalize it. We can simply compute um, what the uh, expected values are. And here is where we can use the linear um, quadratic structure in the preferences of the consumers as well as the firms to basically compute linear strategies um, that are going to be linear independent of the information structure, whether it's normal or uh, any arbitrary information. So the linearity is going to simply uh, depend just on the posterior expectation. And as you see, the quadratic term in the expectation is going to focus our attention squarely on the variance of the posterior expectation that is the gain from the information structure. So that is an object that's going to accompany us and that's going to drive a lot of the analysis. So I want to draw your attention on that. That is G of S is the variance of the posterior expectation. That is how much we change our beliefs about the willingness to pay from the prior uh, when we arrive, when we get to the signals and therefore from the posteriors. And that's really the gain of information. So it's basically a nothing else than the R squared. Okay? That is how much uh, in terms of the variation of the willingness to pay can be explained to the signals that we receive, to so the data that we get from the consumers. Okay. Um, so, this allows us um, to take advantage of the linear quadratic structure in the following way. It allows us to actually compute what the value of data sharing is for the producer, for the consumer, and for the social value. So pi is the revenue of the producer, ui is the expected utility of the consumer, wi is the social welfare um, as we focus on the interaction between consumer i and producer. Okay. They are all going to be representative of each other, so that, that's fine. Okay. Notice when I'm now, say, for example, describing pi i, I have two entries uh, in the parentheses, the first s and the second s, that changes in the second term when I think about pi i and s i and the empty set, because what I'm thinking about here is that the first entry describes the information that the consumer i has. The second entry is the information that the firm has. Okay. So if we have complete data sharing, they have the same access to the signal. So it's S on the left and S on the right. On the other hand, if we were not to share the data, then the consumer would of course know his own signal, but the firm would not have received any information over and above uh, the common prior. And so the value of data sharing for the producer is just the difference, which is in fact just uh, a scaled version of the variance of the posterior expectation. So what you also notice is that when I'm describing this here, now I'm using the structure of the product market to identify what the gains uh, or the, the benefits from data sharing are. Uh, but of course, I could uh, pursue this analysis with another downstream uh, market 
uh, keeping the data structure and the upstream market as fixed. So in that sense, this model is in fact amenable to variations where we either change the data market or the product market separately, depending on what we think is the right description of the, of the underlying interaction. And when you go through these um, three different uh, values for producer, for consumer, and for uh, the consumer, what you see is that the gain from information is either defined with respect to the entire signal or is re defined with respect to just the signal that agent SI is receiving. So that's simply uh, reflecting the increase in information that happens when we have not just access to the individual information, but also to the information from everybody else. Okay. Some first implication at this point, okay. Consumer and social welfare increase with the information gains by the consumer. That is the more information the consumer has to begin with, the better is for him. Uh, but they decrease with the gains that the inform that the firm has because uh, in this linear quadratic setting price discrimination actually reduces uh, social welfare okay if the consumer at the one extreme were to know their types perfectly so there's zero error term then of course data sharing is socially harmful because the only thing that it does do is enable uh, the firm to price discriminate, it doesn't help the individual consumer to make um, better decisions. Okay. On the other hand, um, if the individual consumers are uninformed, that means if their variance is positive, but the complete data is providing more information, then data sharing can benefit consumers and can lead to an increase in social welfare as well. Okay. Um, so here are the two polar opposites that we want to think about, uh, or we'll come back uh, in the in the analysis. One is what I referred to earlier on as a common attribute. So when the signal is reflecting the information that comes from a common willingness to pay, uh, but the errors are independent. Okay. In the second polar case, uh, we have independent types. So the preferences are completely idiosyncratic but there's a common error term. In that case, we have a common experience. Okay? These are sort of the two extreme cases of, um, uh, of the social dimension of the data. In one, we're trying to filter out the idiosyncratic errors to get at the common attribute. In the other, we're going to try to filter out the common error to get at the individual experience. Um, in the real world, we, we face a combination of the two, but it none helps us to think about these two extremes. Okay. Um, good. Now we come to the key notion, and so that's why I want to spend a little bit of time on this, to the key notion of the data externality. Okay. What's the utility uh, for the consumers when the others share their signals, but he prefers not to share their signal? Okay. That's the utility that when the consumers observes the signals of the others, it's his own signal. So he observes the entire vector S, but the firm is simply having to use the information it gets from the others, okay? So when we look then on the right, where we form the expectation, we see that the quantity decision that the consumer is making uh, benefits from the entire vector S, whereas the pricing decision that the firm is making is only using the information that he gets about consumer I that he can infer from all of the other signals. So, so that's important, okay? The data externality be quite um, abstractly that consumer I suffers or is being generated by the other consumers is simply coming when Initially, we were starting out with the firm having no information about the consumer. And then we add the information, that is, we add the information that the others give to the firm and allow the firm, therefore, to make a pricing decision that is more tailored to the underlying demand. Okay. So the data externality is simply the difference between having access to the information of the others and not having access to the information of the others from the point of view of the firm because it's a firm that varies or that impacts the welfare of the consumer. Okay. 
And so here's another way to think about the social nature of the data, okay? If sharing the signal is harmful for consumer eye, okay, then the consumer eye can expect compensation because he basically makes a decision to give the information. But if sharing the information by consumer eye helps predict the underlying willingness to pay off some other consumers, then the consumer eye cannot expect compensation because this participation simply does not change um, the outcomes uh, that he is experiencing. Okay. And likewise, if sharing uh, as I is harmful for the other consumers, then the other consumers can also not expect to be compensated. And so the externality is basically operating um, through these two sources or two channels. Okay. In our environment, we can uh, give an explicit expression for the data externality for this abstract object. Again, in terms of the gains of information, the gains in the variance of the posterior expectation from these various signals such as S, SI, and S at minus I. Okay. Well, don't have to go through the details here as I'm going to move now to an illustration. Okay. So, so that is the impact that data is having on the producer and the consumer. So on the uh, producer market, on the downstream market. We have did not yet talked about the upstream market. We have not yet talked about the data market. And so let's do that now. And let's think about whether and under what condition we might see uh, profitable data sharing to emerge in the data market. So, so we're moving now from the lower end of the market, from the downstream market to the upstream market. And we think, what are the conditions under which we may see data sharing arise? And when profitable data sharing arises, is there a link, a relationship, a systematic relationship between profitability and social efficiency of the data share? And the discrepancy between these two is uh, what we're going to establish and what we're going to be interested in, in analyzing further. Okay. So just briefly, uh, because um, really the uh, time is otherwise running away, um, we're going to think about um, a data market is basically a bilateral contracting between the consumer and the data platform by which we simply contract individually between consumer and the platform to uh, allow for an inflow of data into the platform and a compensation for that data to the consumer. Okay. Likewise, there's going to be a bilateral a contract between the producer that's getting data and the intermediary that's procuring data. And again, there's going to be a fee that um, is going to be charged to the producer now to have access to the data. So we are modeling the data market here as an exchange between data and money in either direction. Uh, the early examples of Google and Facebook uh, clearly suggest that uh, not all markets are operating that way. So, for example, the market between consumers and the digital platform often is not involved in the change between money and data, but between service and data. Uh, here, we're simply going to choose one uniform uh, scale dimension in which we value the data, uh, but clearly uh, what matters is more the efficiency of the trade, not so much the currency in which this trade is supported. Okay, uh, the timing is the data broker offers an exante payment to the consumers for the data. So think about this as basically uh, the general user agreement that you sign when you use on Facebook and afterwards you simply the data flows. The same thing happens between the data broker and the merchant and then when the data becomes available it flows through with the system. Okay. Finally, the data informs decision in the downstream market by the merchant charging a price and by the consumer buying a, a particular quantity. Okay. Uh, in order for data sharing to arise, it must be the case that the consumers as well as the producers have an incentive to participate in the exchange in the trade. And so that gives us two participation constraints, one for the producer, which says that the payment that he's making can't be larger than the gains that he gets from the information. And likewise, um, the compensation that the consumer is getting must at least be large enough to offset um, 
the possible negative externality that we suffer. Okay. Okay, so, so these are just the participation constraint, and I want to emphasize here that we're going to look at ex ante participation constraint. That is, we're not going to price each individual data piece digit separately, but we're simply signing uh, ex ante user agreements and then the data flows. Mm -hmm. So we, we won't see uh, incentive constraints, uh, but we see participation constraints. Okay? Let's dig a little bit deeper and try to understand these are the participation constraints. They will be satisfied as equality. So we can simply um, going to uh, set them equal to the relative terms. What is interesting is that the compensation of the consumer that the consumer receives can be uh, completely decomposed in this data externality that we defined earlier and the change in utility that comes from data share. Okay. And likewise, we can um, describe, and that's the final line on this slide, we can describe the revenue of the firm as simply the uh, sum or the difference rather between the change in social value minus the data externality. Okay. This last piece is significant because it tells us that the revenue, the intermediary, sorry, the revenue of the intermediary is to some extent reflecting the change in social welfare, okay? If it were to only reflect this, we basically had established right away that data trade would uh, arise at the efficient level. But what we see is that the revenue has a second term, namely that we deduct the data externality. Since the data externality will often be negative, in fact, we're going to add a term, which means that the revenue of the intermediary is going to deviate in systematic ways from the social welfare. And that is the, uh, the first time that we now in formula see the fact that data trade, the equilibrium data trade, the revenue maximizing data trade, and the efficient data trade will typically diverge and will diverge in a systematic manner. And the formula that I'm displaying to you here, the, the last line is basically um, just underlying that or um, giving you the representation of that divergence and it's captured entirely in the data externality. Okay. So the first result that we have is that complete data intermediation is profitable, even only if, okay, uh, we have an inequality that basically says that the value of information that I'm getting from all the others about agent I, okay, is at least three times as large as the additional information that I were to get if I not only had access to the other's information, but also to the information by the agent. So what that means is that as soon as that the social data is sufficiently large, okay, the impact of the social data is sufficiently large, um, I will see um, profitable data trade. Okay. Notice that um, that condition is different from the condition that we saw earlier on, on the uh, condition for efficient data trading. And so we can infer immediately that there's a discrepancy between, there's a wedge between efficiency and, um, and revenue maximizing and equilibrium trade. Okay. Right. So um, let's try to pinpoint where the market failures arrive, okay? Um, again, I'm going to focus on the distinction between common attributes and common experience. So in common attributes, we just have um, a idiosyncratic error, but a common underlying value. In common experience, we have a common error, but idiosyncratic values. Okay. We can uh, basically identify these two things with the correlation coefficient. So let me, for the example and for the illustration that I'm going to give you now, um, give it to you in the form of a Gauss Gaussian data structure. That is, we're having correlation coefficients um, for the underlying willingness to pay alpha and for the error term beta. Okay, so we basically now have the entire data captured in terms of these two correlation structures two correlation coefficients, we can refer to that as a data structure. Where do we see um, gains from data trade from a social point of view? Okay, 
Um, that is being displayed in this uh, in this first illustration. Okay, so let me help you uh, read this diagram. On the x-axis, we have the correlation coefficient in terms of the underlying willingness to pay. And on the y-axis, we have the correlation coefficient uh, in the error. Okay, what you see is that we have a socially efficient trade should occur, okay, whenever either the common experience is larger, this is alpha is close to one, so that is the, um, the I guess, the southeast corner, yeah, is that, no, sorry, is that, yes, the southwest corner, yes, and or the northeast corner, uh, no, the or the northwest corner, so it's southeast and northwest, when uh, the common experience is large, but the, um, the preferences are very idiosyncratic. Okay. Why is that the case? Well, uh, whenever the underlying, the data structure differs between error and underlying willingness to pay, so between error and fundamental, that's when we can filter, that's when this uh, data filtering works uh, very well, and that's when we have gains from data sharing. So whenever the data structure in the error and the fundamental are sufficiently different, that's why you have the empty area along the diagonal, when that is um, sufficiently different, we should share from a social point of view the data, okay? But, and, and so that's basically uh, the blues um, data structures. But what we see is that the revenue is going to be positive, um, only covering when there's a common, um, when there's a common attributes, when there is a lot of correlation in the underlying willingness to pay and therefore we can learn a lot about each other's preferences and that's when the data externality is in fact negative okay so uh, this last second picture that i'm going to uh, introduce here is basically the same as the one before uh, but it introduces also the data externality okay the orange uh, area shows you when the data externality is positive, okay? But of course, what we're interested in is more the complement to that, the wide area when the data externality is negative and when the revenue of the digital platform is uh, larger than the gains in the social welfare. And when that is the case, um, we see that basically there's going to be too much data sharing. That's the area that is green but not blue, where uh, the data externality is so large that, in fact, we're going to be able to have profitable data sharing, even though from a social point of view, uh, we should not share the data. So this is, in a sense, the picture um, that you should take home with. Um, whenever the revenue is positive, the market will support data sharing, but we see that that's quite different from what should happen from a socially efficient point of view. I also want to emphasize that um, what this picture therefore also conveys is that market failure arise for two reasons. Where the area is green but not blue, we see too much data sharing, too much collecting of data. Okay. But that's not the only thing that the model and the analysis suggest. By contrast, there will also be areas when the market will not support data sharing. So that's when our uh, is negative when the revenue is too small for the intermediate to um, have the data flow through him. But the socially efficient data actually suggests that we share data. And that's happened it's when the data externality is positive. The um, digital platform cannot monetize this positive externality. And we actually see too little data sharing. In a sense, we can't organize the market in a way that it filters out the common error, allow the individuals to understand the individual preferences. So, so this is a quite rich picture because it says that not a uniform prediction that says that there will always be too much data sharing. In fact, when we're trying to learn about idiosyncratic preference, the market will not give us uh, enough information or will not support data sharing. Uh, 
that's the main result. Let me now not just. So Dirk, uh, if I yeah. can, just you've got a quarter of an hour left. Yes, exactly. And so um, this is the main result a complete data sharing. And now we're basically going to say, is this the best way uh, by which the digital platform? will support data sharing or might there be strategies that the digital platform has that extends the range where the revenue is positive and where it's positive may possibly even increase the revenue by uh, aggregating and packaging the information and so that will be the first results um, and we're going to uh, obtain that by thinking about uh, in more detail uh, and with more resolution about what an optimal data policy by the intermediary is. Okay. One thing that data intermediary is, he could choose not to share all of the data. Okay. He could also um, create asymmetric information in the market between the producers and the consumers. Okay. The intermediary. Um, and we will see that that's not the direction he wants to uh, go. Another direction that will be quite uh, productive for him, though, is to basically not collect idiosyncratic uh, in individual or match signals, that is one signal for every consumer, but to anonymize the signals and basically provide the producer just with an aggregate anonymous uh, piece of information about the underlying market. Okay. There might be also further instruments um, in terms of correlating and introducing noise in the signals that under some condition will be helpful, but today we will focus um, on one uh, and more importantly on two. Okay, so um, the, the first result uh, is entirely straightforward. Uh, that's to say the outflow of the data that is once I have collected as an intermediary any data, I will want to basically and push all of that information out to the producer because I want to the producer to do as best as possible and to use all the information that I have collected because that will allow me to extract the largest amount of information from the producer and will increase the revenue of the digital plan. Okay. What is more surprising is that for the inflow of the data, that is when I'm thinking about what kind of data should I take in, from the consumers, it will typically be the case that the intermediary will obtain strictly greater profit by not collecting individual information, but by collecting anonymized signals. Okay. Why? Because in the revenue calculation of the intermediary, um, what matters is not just the social gains, but also the data externality. And I'm going to make the data externality as large as possible okay, by basically uh, just looking at the aggregates uh, rather than idiosyncratics for which I have to actually compensate the individual user. This is sort of quite interesting because if you think about uh, pricing sort of by integrated platform where um, think about Amazon or Uber or Lyft, um, which basically both collect data about the consumer and then also price products. What you find there is that they typically choose not to personalize the price, but rather keep it at a uniform price level. Okay. It doesn't mean that they can't respond to aggregate changes in the demand. That is, when traffic in a city is high, they will, of course, increase the price. But what you not see typically at Uber or at Amazon is that they're going to charge you a price that is tailored to your individual uh, purchase history. And so uh, here, the theorem is basically giving you the optimality of this strategy by basically leveraging the data externality, but by lowering the compensation for the data that the digital platform has to incur. Okay. Um, I, I won't go to the proof, but let me just highlight that in fact, um, it uses the decomposition of the revenue function in terms of social gains and data externalities quite critically. Okay. Um, let me just uh, talk about two issues. Think about the digital privacy paradox. So that's the, the issue um, that whenever, uh, I guess, people have run experiments or observe in market, that in fact, the compensation that the consumers get for the individual data at the market level uh, is often quite negligible, negligible or non-existent. Okay? Um, 
that insight we can actually formalize quite uh, nicely here. So think about simply the situation when we have more and more consumers, okay? Now notice the optimal data provision is anonymized, okay? That is, I'm not really using an individual consumer to get information about him, but more about the market, okay? If that's the case, as n goes to infinite uh, or becomes very large, the individual consumer's compensation that's necessary to uh, give the consumer the incentive to sell his data is actually going to zero. And the total compensation to all of the consumers converges against the finite number. In fact, if the underlying fundamentals are correlated, that's the second point, the total compensation is even decreasing in a number of consumers I'm collecting data from because the data externalities become larger. By contrast, the intermediate's revenue and the profit grows linearly in N. So, so, so that basically means that um, the profit is basically increasing in scale for the uh, for the intermediary, scale is, is profitable. It's sort of, there's a convexity argument behind it. Um, and um, the compensation uh, decreases to zero. So this gives you one rationalization of the digital privacy paradox, namely that consumers don't get uh, any data. The anonymization result is a strong result. So let me point uh, in the last few minutes to um, limits of that okay um okay so we started out in a world where the consumers are ex ante homogeneous a general result is that the data broker collects anonymous data even only if the information reduces social welfare okay and that's because he wants to avoid the compensation for the individual data that doesn't increase the social welfare okay what does it mean uh, in practice? Well, um, here are two applications. So think about now not just an environment where we have um, ex ante homogeneous, but group homogeneous uh, individuals. That is, you know, consumers in the US and consumers in Europe, consumers on the West Coast, consumers on the East Coast look different. Okay. Then it will actually be optimal to have tailored pricing at the group level, but not within the group. Um, and, and that will depend on, on the size of the group. Now, our illustration here is a little bit silly because, of course, everything at the internet is not 10, but 10 to the power of n or something like that, rather. Okay. So that means uh, we should expect to see some uh, pricing, but not at the level of the individual, but at the level of groups. And the question is just how big are the groups, how big are the segments? Okay. Um, let me give another example where we see um, a more fine-tuned information policy which uses some personalization but also some aggregation so think about uh, now a richer set of preferences where besides wi which is basically an element of horizontal differentiation we also have an element of horizontal differentiation so that's the preferred location preferred variety preferred specificity of each consumer Okay. Uh, in that sense, in now we basically want to have um, personalized match data on the horizontal component because we're trying to match the product to the consumer preference that will allow us to provide a higher volume product, but we will abstain from um, collecting individualized information, individualized pricing at the level of the willingness to pay. So that gives you sort of a richer picture of um, what pricing policies say at Amazon or at, uh, at Eva Market. Okay. Um, okay. And, and with this, um, I, um, I, I'm, I'm basically coming to the end of that. So let me uh, maybe reflect just a little bit about the the initial words of Jacques. We, we haven't coordinated that, but it, it's useful. So, um, you know, on a theoretical level, we are, I think we have some interesting results that allow us to shed some practice on the sources of revenue and the sources um, that drive the data collection of the digital platforms. Okay. Um, the, the calculus uh, will inform the digital platforms. 
in terms of what kind of information they make available and how the information will uh, turn out uh, in, in to be used in instruments such as prices or product recommendations and um, those responses um, can be quite different and, and reflect uh, the gains from trade that can happen on the product market okay uh, but um, what we also saw is that the social dimension of the data that really is the engine for collecting the information is also the engine for the externality. And so um, we typically should therefore expect that we're very far from a socially efficient allocation of the data. Okay. Um, actually, uh, that also leads me to 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 establish sort of a, a, a few further implication right so in our model um we actually explicitly give property rights of the data to the consumers because consumers could agree or abstain from data sharing uh, and what we saw that just an explicit um assignment of the property rights in the presence of the externalities is clearly not sufficient to establish uh, efficient data markets okay we focus today uh, on the economic harm that consumers uh, accrue because they don't earn their full social value of the input right so that that was the externality but of course if you think about policy issues that are sort of relevant today and, and, and certainly uh, in the very near future uh, there might be other harms, um, say threats to democracy uh, from social networks, consumer addictions and all, all so on. I want to perhaps um, highlight that these questions that we're asking here theoretically are really uh, sort of unsolved questions in the sense that what's the value of a database, what's the value of social data is really something for which economists just developing model yet these are important uh, models and important question as the recent cases that UJ in the US, the FTC uh, is pursuing against Facebook, um, supposedly the EC is uh, supposed to make some uh, new laws, uh, proposal for new laws, so the Digital Service Act, Digital Markets Act, public today. In fact, just today, the FTC uh, announced a very wide uh, ranging privacy probes and all of the social networks to think about what's the practice by which the social social data. So that's directly to what we are talking about here. These are all issues um, for which as economists, we provide a lens that then helps policymakers to think about this and provide first principles. And so clearly we hope to contribute to that discussion um, a little bit with this paper. Okay. And um, I would like to end here. Well, thank you very much, Doug. This was uh, as great as I hoped it would be. So uh, very useful and uh, there's a huge amount of other work to be done. So uh, yes. people who are listening, I mean, for instance, there is, no competition between uh, plat no, between platforms here, and you can you could add this and so on. So you know, please, uh, all of you who are listening, join us in keep on working on the, those topics. Uh, that's really needed. Uh, Sanjay, you want to say a word? Uh, no, thank you. I think it's just perfect timing. I mean, the in the UK, uh, you're aware that we now have very different regime policy regime increasingly. So in the UK as well, they are yep. launching. Um, a set of uh, policy initiatives uh, on these uh, essentially fundamentally relating to social value yep. nature of the data. Um, yeah, I thought it was a yeah, fantastic introduction to a very broad set of practical issues. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, Jacques, again for organizing this. And Lorenzo. Bye-bye, um, <laughs> everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.